Next guest, um, Alex. I've actually known this, well, I'm going to call him a kid because he's a kid, uh, for a very long time. Uh, grew up in the same town as I. Um, he started his career in 2006 at, at uh, Espresso Vivace and uh, managed Sweet Leaf uh, uh, in, New, in New York and Queens uh, for some time and now has just taken a job as associate editor at Sprudge.com. So, super welcome to Alex Bernson. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good to go. Am I on? Cool. Thank you. Alrighty. So, in recent years, a recurring theme here at the Nordic Barista Cup and at other events, like the SCA Symposium, has been that we as an industry, need to evolve our service models past the standard fast food model that emerged in North America and came to dominate especially coffee bar design. In these talks, many people have already quite eloquently described why we need elevated service models that better fit our elevated products. That's why the theme of today is service. And I'm really excited by what the coffee industry can learn from the high-end food and alcohol industries in this regard. These industries, and the luminaries from them, with whom I'm sharing the stage, have a long and successful history of innovating and elevating their products and their service. However, we need to keep in mind that coffee, food, and alcohol are all very different products. These products, and crucially, the places these products are consumed, often play very different social roles in people's lives. If we do not keep these differences in mind as we try to elevate our service, we run the risk of creating service establishments that are no longer suited to serving the role of cafes in our customers' lives. If we, in fact, do want to create a break from the old roles of the cafe, we should be doing that based on a solid understanding of what that social role is. Coffee is, at its root, a social object, an object that brings people together an object that knits together the social fabric of our lives. Peter Giuliano gave an excellent overview of this idea in his introduction for the, this year's SEA Symposium, and there have been a great many academic books, articles, and such written on the subject. Um, I read as many of these works as I could when I studied at Wesleyan University, where I uh, majored in urban sociology from a feminist and queer theory perspective. In my theories, or excuse me, in my studies, I found that seemingly small design changes, everything from seating to bar layout to the words we use to greet our customers can have huge effects on the social role of a given cafe space. My goal here today is to give you all a better understanding of first, how service design and social role are interconnected, and second, what social roles cafes have played and continue to play in the shaping of modern urban public life. First, we're going to examine the differences between the production and service tasks that food servers, bartenders, and baristas are required to engage in, with an eye towards how these differences shape these social spaces. Second, we're going to examine the evolution of cafes' physical designs throughout history as a way to understand how the evolution of the cafe as a type of service design has shaped and reflected the evolution of Western ideas of modernity and public social life. How coffee, food, and alcohol are produced creates all sorts of constraints on how those products can be served. And how those products are served creates all sorts of constraints on the social experience of the places that serve them. This idea of constraints influencing social roles is at the heart of feminist and queer theory. For thinkers in these disciplines, social roles are things that have meaning only in as much as they are performed continuously every day. We understand ourselves and each other based on the specific style with which social actions are performed in a given moment. As these actions are repeatedly performed in the same style over time, the illusion of an inherent unitary identity is created. Even though, in actual fact, individuals have a great deal of flexibility in their performances and may present very contrasting performances at different times. RuPaul sums this idea up nicely. You're born naked, and the rest is drag. Feminist and queer thought takes this idea of identity and performativity as a starting point for understanding how the structure of society can validate, 
coerce, or censure different sorts of social performances based on an individual's gender or sexual identity. Worthwhile issues to explore, but what exactly does this all have to do with service workers? Well, to start with, one implication of identity as performance is the power it gives the individual to control how their external identity is understood in a given moment separate from their internal feelings. As any skilled service worker is aware, at least intuitively, the goal of service work is to present a performance of your role where your stylization makes your guest feel welcome, at ease, and cared for, even if you aren't particularly feeling the love inside at that moment. Everything from making eye contact when guests enter the establishment to patiently listening as they order or ask questions are specific stylizations designed to create the impression of this caring service identity. This is the real power of understanding the social as performative. Any sort of social interaction that may happen between guests and the service establishment, and especially any interaction between guests and service workers, must be understood as being profoundly shaped by the constraints placed on performance styles by the general nature and specific physical and service designs of that establishment. One clear example of this is the ways in which the physical production of a product can constrain the social performances by the workers in a service establishment. In the standard models of restaurant, bar, and coffee shop service, food servers are the least constrained. The myriad different tasks required to prepare food are so rigidly time and space sensitive that it's necessary to have back of house staff wholly dedicated to them, freeing up front of house to focus solely on service tasks. Bartenders must do both production and service tasks, making their performances more constrained than food servers. Their bartender's primary constraint is spatial. They must stand behind the bar, and for certain produ production tasks, they must stand in specific places. However, bartenders are still relatively free spatially. They routinely roam over the entire length of their bar during service. <clears throat> bartenders are only somewhat constrained temporarily. Cocktails must be built in specific orders and shaken or stirred for specific amounts of time. Taps take a set amount of time to pour, etc. However, serving beer or wine is still a relatively quick process, and as long as you build in the correct order, then add ice and shake or stir immediately before service, you can take 30 seconds or three minutes to build an identical tasting cocktail. In the current fast food models dominant in North America, baristas are heavily spatially and temporally constrained by their production tasks. Espresso shots must be pulled and milk must be steamed for an extremely specific amount of time in a specific order, and the barista must be standing in front of the espresso machine the entire time to do this. Manual brewing is similarly spatially and temporally constrained. These different levels of constraints have profound impacts on the nature of service each type of service worker is able to provide. Because of the lack of constraints on food servers, food servers are able to finely tune the length, frequency, and depth of their, so of their service performance to the specific needs and desires of a given table. If a party of guests is in the mood for conversation, either social or about the product, the server is able to spend additional time with that table. This flexibility is what allows food servers to form strong relationships with their guests, even on the very first visit. This, in turn, plays into how regular customers are formed at restaurants. The price and involvement of restaurant dining means that most customers cannot visit the same restaurant often, especially at the higher end of the restaurant world. However, a food server's ability to really invest in each visit means that a guest may feel themselves to be a regular who is known and appreciated by the restaurant after just a couple of visits. Food servers are expected to provide this high level of service every meal, and this in turn influences the way that guests approach the social role of a restaurant in their lives. A long and involved service interaction helps to make going to a restaurant feel like an end in and of itself, which in turn makes going to a restaurant, especially a high-end one, something that guests are less likely to do for very casual social interactions. 
Bartenders are more constrained than food servers, but they are still able to prioritize their service performances to a fairly high degree. If a guest needs to order or get a check, the bartender can do that before engaging in production tasks, or at the very least, slot it easily into their queue of tasks. When a guest is seated at the bar, they experience their relationship to the bartender fairly intimately because of the very low barrier to conversation created by the bartender's physical constraints, you know, that is, staying behind the bar but constantly circulating, and by the lack of temporal constraints. Few tasks rigidly require interrupting a conversation, and few tasks require a bartender's full attention. This helps explain the close relationship that can quickly develop between bartenders and their guests, especially when a guest is in the habit of coming to and sitting at the bar fairly regularly. The low barriers to conversation and informal nature of bar service directly encourage the informal, indeterminate social nature of bars. A less structured and more discretionary service interaction means that guests are able to engage in a wider range of social interaction in a bar than in a restaurant. The discretionary aspect extends to privacy as well. If guests want to engage in general socializing with the bar staff or other patrons, they can sit at the bar. If they want to have social interactions that are more private and focused on the people they came to the bar with, they can sit at a table or stand and only interact with the bar staff for the basic service requirements. Baristas are far more constrained than bartenders or food servers. A uh, massive caveat here though, um, table service models are quite common in Australia and Asia and among less quality focused establishments in Europe. But in this discussion, I'm referring to baristas in the fast food style coffee shop. In one of these establishments, due to the strict temporal requirements of co uh, quality coffee production, any service task the barista engages in must necessarily be a lower priority than the majority of their production tasks. And there is often hardly any time for discretionary socializing. Further, because the barista must be standing behind the espresso machine or brew bar, Unless the customer is encouraged to stand directly in front of these areas, the chances for service and social interaction are minimal. This idea of increasing chances for social performance by controlling where the customers stand finally brings us to our first applied example for cafe design. Generally, fast food style coffee service is laid out such that you line up along the bar, which is really more of a wall of service items with a line starting in front of the pastry case. Then, once you reach the front of the line, you order, you get out of the way quickly for the next customer, then you go and mill about awkwardly in the cafe, and sometime later, your drink is shouted at you, and you go and pick it up from the espresso machine. Espresso Vivace in Seattle pioneered a reversed layout of espresso machine followed by register that has since been adopted by many other cafes. This layout forces the guest to stand in line across from the barista for the duration of the prep time, creating a much longer opportunity for socializing that enables a more involved service and social interaction between guest and barista. Even with this alternative layout, though, the possible interactions between guest and barista are still radically shorter than the potential for sustained interaction afforded to bartenders and food servers. Baristas have less time less flexibility, and less attention to dedicate to performing an involved service identity. This perfunctory, highly informal service interaction greatly contributes to the highly casual and indeterminate social nature of the cafe. The guest is hardly required to interact with the baristas at all when ordering, and once they have received their drink and gone out into the cafe, the very tight physical and temporal constraints on the barista behind the bar means that the guest is not likely to have any further interactions with service workers unless they so choose. Because the guest is left to their own devices, they feel free to spend anywhere from a very short to a very long amount of time hanging out in the cafe, largely doing whatever they please. This informal nature is at the heart of the social role of the cafe in people's lives, and it is by no means a wholly bad thing. This quote from David Schomer helps explain why the very low requirement nature of food service, uh, excuse me, of fast food coffee service can be an asset. People don't always want a lot of interaction, especially when they are pre-caffeine. 
This truth is especially important in light of the nature of regular coffee shop guests. A true regular at a coffee shop often goes to that same shop every day, sometimes multiple times a day. With that level of frequency, being expected to engage in an in-depth service or social interaction can feel like a burden, and shorter interactions can be sufficient to build rapport. While this perfunctory level of service does have certain advantages, many people have pointed out how it's not appropriate for places that are attempting to serve very high-end coffee or serve food in addition to coffee. Providing a more involved level of coffee service generally requires a splitting of production and service roles. It's also possible to relax the temporal constraints on baristas by focusing on lower volume. Especially when combined with the use of bar seating and service, this can alleviate some of the constraints on the barista, enabling sustained interaction with customers. One great example of this is the bar at Intelligentsia Logan Square in Chicago. A customer can sidle up to any of the seats along the bar island, and they will be greeted with a menu and served, just like an alcohol bar, by one of the constantly circulating baristas. If they order a manual brewing option, the brew setup is brought to right in front of them and then prepared there, allowing the barista to engage guests in discussion during the prep time. Of course, this style of layout is not particularly new. But the way it integrates with North American high volume carryout service certainly is. Models like these can help increase the perceived care of a service performance. They allow for more sustained and meaningful interaction between guest and barista for both social and product education purposes during both the initial service interaction and over the course of the guest's stay with the circulating barista. However, to really understand what effects these sorts of changes can have on the social role of the cafe, we have to get clearer on exactly what the cafe's social role is. You may have heard people refer to the cafes as third places, a term originally coined by sociologist Ray Oldenburg to describe how the coffee shop occupies a semi-public social space that's suspended between the traditional home and work spheres. I've switched to the term coffee shop very specifically here. In, it is the most general way to refer to a caf, uh, coffee retail space, and as we will soon see, the terms coffee house, cafe, and coffee bar actually refer to quite specific historical moments in the evolution of the coffee shop. This idea of the coffee shop as a place between places, what social scientists call a liminal zone, has been central to the role of coffee shops throughout history. Since the beginning of the modern era, places that sell coffee have served as the mediating spaces where the public and private spheres of a society come into contact and into conflict. Changing social needs and desires have always resulted in coffee shops changing their forms in response. And the introduction of new forms of coffee shop often directly led to massive changes in society. There is no better way to understand the intertwined evolution than by looking at the evolution of one of the coffee shop's principal constraints on guests' social performances, namely, the selection of available seating options. The first shop to sell coffee in the Western world was founded by Pascal Rosy in London around 1654. By the 1660s, coffee shops, then called coffee houses, were firmly established parts of the emerging public life of England. By 1700, there were over 2,000 coffee houses in London. The defining physical feature of the London coffee house was its long trestle tables. A guest entering the establishment was expected to take a seat at the next available chair at one of the communal tables. You wound up with merchants, scribes, lawyers, tradesmen, and minor nobility all rubbing elbows. This lack of formality and seating structure helped create a much more informal, open style of social performance. This intermixing of different people made the coffee house into a fantastically socially generative place. For the first time, there was a place where people could come together freely, a place where no person had superior claim to the space. 
It's not surprising then that some of the first organizations for discussing the democratization of English political life were formed in coffee houses. Coffee houses were also hotbeds of literary and scientific discussion, and of course, a great deal of gossip of all sorts. Some of the first London newspapers began as digests of the talk going on in the coffee houses, pro proving just how much the pulse of society flowed through the coffee house. The free public intermixing in the coffee house also naturally lent itself to economic exchange, and people started holding auctions and conducting other business in coffee houses. Coffee houses were quick to respond, both by building dedicated auction rooms in some cafes and by putting in much more private booth style seating for conducting business. Some businesses even rented these booths out as their primary office space. Though modern coffee shops are a long way from the London coffee house, this idea of a place that is open to all comers and focused on social exchange is still at the heart of the role that coffee shops serve in society. Of course, our seating options are much more varied than just trestle tables these days. And that is in large part due to the next phase in coffee shop evolution, the Continental Cafe. Cafes began springing up in the early 1700s in Paris and Vienna. By taking up the coffee house's trend towards greater seating variety and extending it by integrating food service and opening up the interface with the street, these cafes came to play a defining role in the development of the modern urban lifestyle. At this time, urban Paris was being radically reshaped by the construction of the Grand Boulevards and an overall investment in public infrastructure. At the same time, the opening up of commerce was creating new, more well-off classes of city dwellers, specifically the bourgeois and petite bourgeois middle classes. These trends led to a flourishing of public street life. One major feature of the Continental Cafe is its sidewalk seating, which lets guests take part in the new street life. This seating represented a radical new level of visibility for guest social performances. The Continental Cafe, in fact, came to be defined by the varying level of seating visibility and therefore publicity it offered its guests. Uh, when I say publicity, I mean it in the sociological sense, the degree to which something is understood as or experienced as being in public, which has a lot to do with the idea of visibility. Parisian and Viennese cafes integrated large numbers of glass windows into their facades, which allowed guests in the interior to observe street life in a more removed way than the sidewalk seating, creating a second level of visibility and semi-publicity. For guests seeking even more privacy, many cafes offered upstairs or interior rooms that were totally invisible from the street. These varying levels of publicity allowed guests to control their relationship to the urban milieu. This combined with the informality and accessibility that was already present in the coffee house to give the cafe a unique role as a center of neighborhood communities. Everyday life and socializing with acquaintances increasingly moved out of the home environment and into the cafe. In addition, much political and artistic thought moved out of the more private salons and into the semi-public cafe. The semi-public nature of the Continental Cafe has only become more pronounced in the modern urban coffee shop, as the role of the domestic sphere continues to shrink and the traditional divides between the work and public spheres break down. Consequently, modern coffee shops tend to offer a wide variety of seating options with varying degrees of publicity. The next evolution in coffee shops was the advent of the Italian coffee or espresso bar in the early 20th century. This style of coffee shop often did away with the seats altogether, opting instead for bars where customers could sidle up, order a drink, consume it quickly, and be on their way. Bars were also integrated into more classic cafe styles, a practice still very popular to this day, but in almost every case, an informal sidling up to the bar was still allowed in addition to table service. This style of service went hand in hand with the introduction of espresso coffee. You've probably heard that the term espresso comes from, comes from the idea of a cup being made expressly for you 
in an express amount of time. This idea is at the heart of the social role of the espresso bar. At the time the espresso bar was coming on the scene, modern life was experiencing a high level of industrialization, mechanization, and regimentation, especially in urban areas. The espresso bar responded to this sudden preoccupation with schedule and time by providing a very simple service model that enabled the rapid acquisition and consumption of products. This made the espresso bar a very transient place. Large numbers of people were coming and going rapidly throughout the day, making the espresso bar the perfect place for a quick solo recharge or chat with acquaintances. However, people were less likely to linger and make extended use of the espresso bar due to its transience and its lack of different levels of publicity. This transience reflected the increasing transience of urban social life, with cities becoming ever more densely packed, disconnected from the private domestic sphere, full of constant movement, and highly scheduled. These trends have continued on into the present day, with the informality and anonymity of the standard fast food style of coffee shop creating an even greater level of transience compared to the espresso bar style. Though the trends towards working in coffee shops lead some guests to greatly extended stays. This brings us to the modern North American coffee shop. In its seating design, and especially its social role, this coffee shop is an amalgamation of the three types that came before it. The coffee shop emerged in the early 1980s, responding to that era's trends towards suburbanization, social atomization, and commodified consumerism. The coffee shop is a place where at least the veneer of community can be maintained despite the hollowing out of communal social life. As the middle and upper classes in the current generation have returned to the center city, and as traditional social structures erode, along with the boundaries between work and home, the coffee shop and its capacity for social mediation, for being a place in between, has become ever more crucial to the functioning of society. So, what have we arrived at? What is the coffee shop? First, it is a site of drug delivery. Guests are going to come more often at more different times of day than most any other service establishment. It is accessible due in part to its minimal service interactions and low price, especially in contrast to restaurants. Asking someone to join you for coffee is the most socially neutral thing you can do. It is semi-public in that it presents a range of options of social performance and publicity. You can come to it alone or in a large group and can socialize amongst yourselves, with strangers, or not at all. It is indeterminate. There are almost no expectations put on how you make use of the space. You can come there for work or leisure and stay as long as you like. Unlike bars or even restaurants, it is the only semi-public place that is fully socially acceptable to be alone indefinitely. It is liminal. It is where conflicting social concepts meet and where they change. In the last five years, mobile technology has radically changed society's understanding of the public and private spheres. For more and more jobs, the traditional requirements of space-specific, largely private offices have become not merely unnecessary, but a hindrance. Socially, you can be standing in a crowd of a thousand people and be functionally private because you're on your phone. Or you can be on an empty street corner, tweeting out to a thousand people publicly. Specialty coffee, or at least the North American fast food style coffee shop, has not yet fully caught up with all this social change. Physical designs, service models, and business models all tend to look largely the same as they did 10 years ago. And that creates all sorts of social tension. One need only look at the still unresolved issue of laptops and coffee shops to see this. Right now, places like Starbucks, 
Pret-a-Manger, and Panera are taking the lead in becoming the new, accessible, indeterminate, informal social spaces because of both their deep financial resources and their focus on experience as much as product. If we want to take the lead in shaping the next great era of the coffee shop's social role, we need to better understand how our decisions affect that social role and what evolving social needs we must respond to. I think modern life has gotten too complicated for there to be one single new type of coffee shop. But I do think that mobile technology, gentrification, and the new modes of business have created a common set of social issues any new type of coffee shop must respond to. As we elevate coffee product and coffee service, we are presented with opportunities to radically reshape the constraints we place on the social performances of our guests and staff. We have the opportunity to radically reshape the social role of the coffee shop. As we seek to do that, there is much we can learn from other service industries, provided we keep our differences in mind. Seriously discussing what the new opportunities could or should actually look like is a speech unto itself, but I do hope that in giving you a sense of the dimensions, and especially the history of the challenge we face, this talk can at least serve as a starting point for that discussion. Thank you. There we go. Questions? First question. First question. I mean, there are a lot of questions in my mind. Anybody have one? Come on. Yep. Uh, do you think the future of coffee shops mean they sort of have to be an office, a home at the same time, or do you think you can go in the opposite direction and just make it just coffee? Because, you know, I think... Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say because... It seems like the way you're saying it's headed, mm -hmm. everybody has to have Wi-Fi, and I understand, because you have to accept that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. But since everybody has personal internet, right. and with rent being really high, right. things like that, if you're a coffee shop owner, I mean, so, do you think you have to? I think that whatever you do, you have to be very um, specific and make a very clear decision as to what your goal is. I think that there's space to do both coffee shops that do not allow or encourage that sort of usage at all. I think there's space to create coffee shops that do a infinitely better job of accommodating that sort of service and making it, instead of a hindrance, something that is core to their business model. And I also think it's really important that we think about how we want to shape how specifically our customers use our, uh, the coffee shop on laptops. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, the Stumptown cafe on 12th Avenue in Seattle. Uh, as you can see, the seating options here, it's a high-backed banquette with a straight back and a narrow, shallow seat. And then the tables are small and low, and the stools are small and low as well. And people are still going to use laptops there, as you can see, but it's not really comfortable to do so. So at least in my experience watching, people don't really stay for more than about an hour using laptops there because you just feel wrong doing it. I think that you know, making decisions like that where we try and sort of nudge our customers in a specific direction will definitely help us create better sorts of coffee shops. <laughs> if you look at uh, this opportunity to give more service, mm -hmm. Is there an estimation how much the customer is willing to pay more for his coffee for the service? If you look at the Starbucks selling a coffee at five dollars or five euros, right. where we are selling at an average of two and a half, three euros. Right. I think that that is a hugely important point. People are not paying for a product. They're paying for an experience. And they are totally happy to pay more for an experience. Um, I've had the good fortune to work at a number of coffee shops that use uh, bar style seating and service and the tips I earn giving uh, bar service as opposed to just fast food service are twice as high or more because people feel like they're getting more from the experience. So I think that as 
you know, we really try and offer them an experience that speaks to what their new desires are, we'll find it so much easier to charge a higher price point for that. Um, I, I see a contradicting point between cafes and mm -hmm. trying to give them service is trying to make the customer uh, comfortable. Right. I don't want service when I'm comfortable. I don't want to be told anything when I'm at, if I'm at a home or home outside home, I just, like, that couch looks really comfortable. Those people look like I don't want to bother them. Right. And so, um, like an Apple store, you walk in, you get service, you walk out. Right. So maybe if you want to give people service, you just give them service and that's it. Maybe. I don't right. know. I totally agree. And I think that, you know, as I said earlier in the talk, it's really important that we understand that for a lot of the reasons people come into a coffee shop, they have no interest in talking to us. In fact, they'd be happy to not talk to us ever. And that's totally fine. But I do think that there is a middle ground where you can give some service but still respect people's needs for privacy. And I think um, a lot of possibility there is looking to things like the American diner model um, like Intelligentsia has done. Or, uh, for example, this is one of my favorite bars. And you know, if, with a bar this long and seating like that, the barista is never going to be in front of a given customer for that long, so it doesn't feel like they're all up in your business, but they can still help you, you know, if you need your water refilled or want to order something. But you're right, it's a really delicate balancing act. I have a follow-up question on that. Sure. But um, I was asked this question a year ago when I was, I was not standing where you're standing, but I was on a stage as well. I would just like to hear your answer to it. Sure. When you're working service, I don't know how long it is since you worked service, or do you still work in service? Uh, a week and a half. Yeah, that's a good answer. Right. Um, when you are in service, how do you, what's your tells for telling whether that person wants more information or less information? Um, well, first off, I like to start with uh, something that uh, Baca from Verve said where you have no business talking to a customer about anything coffee related until the third time they're in your shop. Like, first you need to make them happy to be there for the experience before you get and start you know, throwing descriptors or whatever at them. I think it's really important to start from trying to understand what sort of experience they want and not starting from here's the experience I think they want or I think this product deserves or anything like that. Um, I think actually Mr. Rodzepi's talk did a great job of pointing out that too, where it's not even about, you, know, you just have to meet the customer where they're at and suggest that you care and suggest that they can have milk if they want it instead of starting with being oppositional. Um, but in terms specifically of tells, um, I really like something that actually uh, David Schomer advocates that you when a customer comes into the cafe, you say hi, and then you wait a moment. And in that moment, if they want to talk to you, they're going to say, hi, how are you doing? And if they don't want to talk to you, they're just going to say hi, or they're just going to order. And that way, you totally know where they're at and if they want to engage with you. Now, of course, that is kind of specific to America and how brusque we can be with each other, and, you know, it's different in different cultures, but really, you know, just giving them space to have that first bit of performance and see how they do it is the cue for then how you engage with them. Okay, guys. Alex, thank you so much. Awesome. Really interesting. Thank you. Round of applause, please.